morning again. Thank you very much, uh, Heather, for those notes. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce our keynote speaker today, uh, who has a, uh, an amazing uh, background and, and career. Michael Wilcock is lead social scientist in the World Bank's Development Research Group, where it worked since 1998. And for 12 years, he's also been a lecturer in public policy at Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government. His current research focuses on strategies for enhancing state capability for implementation, on crafting more effective interaction between informal and formal justice systems, and on using mixed methods to assess the effectiveness of complex development interventions. In addition to more than 75 journal articles and book chapters, he is the co-author or co-editor of 10 books, including Contesting Development Participatory Projects and Local Conflict Dynamic in Indonesia, which he was a co and, and Yale University Press, which was a co-recipient of the 2012 Best Book Prize by the American Sociological Association Section on International Development, and more recently, Building State Capability, Evidence, Analysis, Action. He has recently returned from 18 months in Malaysia, where he helped establish the World Bank's first global knowledge and research hub. An Australian national, he completed his undergraduate studies at the University of Queensland and has an MA and PhD in sociology from Brown University. You would agree that we, have, uh, we are very uh, privileged to have him in our presence today to talk on the subject and the work on, on complexity, uh, a term that has come up not only in the main session but in many of the parallel sessions. And I am going to leave it to him to take us through uh, his keynote and thereafter we will have the opportunity to pose questions. Uh, uh, let us uh, welcome Michael to the podium. Thank you very much for that introduction. Thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me to be with you for these uh, past few days here in Istanbul. I've been to many countries in the world, but never to Turkey until this visit. Uh, one of the reasons for being so eager to accept your invitation. Um, a special thanks to the organizers of this conference, to uh, Joe and Heather for uh, a lot of the work they've done to put this all together. Having organized several conferences myself, I know how much work it takes, both seen and unseen, to make these events happen. So thank you so much for uh, giving me a chance to <coughs> excuse me, share some of my thoughts this morning. I'm going to be talking about these questions of complexity and trying to turn an adjective into a noun, or sort of try to give a, a slightly more precise sense of what it is we're talking about when we talk about complex interventions, but talk about that from a research and evaluation standpoint, which is to say how we make knowledge claims about the effectiveness of complex interventions, and in particular, how we make more generalizable claims about the likely effectiveness of a particular intervention when it's moved to a different place or when it's uh, replicated and scaled up. These are the central challenges, I think, of evaluation, of making defensible claims about the effectiveness of interventions of all different kinds. But the challenge just gets ramped up even more once we move into this complex space. And I will suggest as a broader opening statement that the world is only going to get more complex and the interventions we need to wield in, in response to that complexity themselves need to be and will be more complicated and we need to have as evaluators a set of corresponding tools and instruments and theory to help make sense of that. So I'm going to try and pull all of those together or so in the next 40 minutes and then uh, in the subsequent sessions we'll talk about some of these issues in more detail as they play out. Um, <clears throat> but because you're all evaluators I'm going to sort of open by just posing a few opening vignettes about the kinds of challenges we might face, uh, both doing and then responding to evaluation claims. So, for example, imagine we get a result from Bolivia in which we have a carefully designed and implemented pilot intervention providing cash payments to poor rural families uh, who are sending their 10-year-olds to school every day. A rigorous evaluation is done and it finds a significant improvement in the children's test scores. The education minister is very keen to showcase a national flagship initiative in response to this wonderful positive result from the pilot and has adequate resources and full political support to make this happen. Do you advise her to scale up this particular pilot on the basis of that result? 
let's consider another one. <clears throat> this is actually a true story, almost. <laughs> <clears throat> a recent study published in a prestigious evaluation journal using a large cross-country sample finds that countries exiting from regional trade agreements significantly improve their rule of law score in subsequent years. Fiji's Minister of Justice is desperately wanting to improve his country's global ranking on the rule of law index to encourage foreign investment. Do you advise this minister thus to push for Fiji's exit from its regional trade agreements? Third, a randomized control trial of a large women's empowerment project in Bihar, the state of northern India, finds that, on average, the intervention had no effect after two years. Do you recommend shutting it down? Well, we, if this is a more smaller classroom situation, we could have a, a bit of debate around each of the answers to these questions, but I'm suggesting that I hope, as good evaluators, that your answers uh, to all of those questions are that it depends. <laughs> you can't answer those questions on the basis of the information that you've been given. Um, but if it depends, then the next question we should be asking, well, on what exactly does the right answer, or at least a slightly better answer than nothing, depend? How would we know what a good answer looked like, and where else would we go to find those, the right kinds of answers? And what would we need to have at our disposal to be able to elicit those kinds of answers? I've posed these three opening vignettes because I think they are representative of the kinds of challenges we face in evaluation and in research more broadly. We need to take a result from a small size initiative and we have to try and extrapolate from that to try and make claims about whether we think it will happen at a larger scale. We have to go from a very general set of results to try and give advice to a very specific context, to a specific person, a minister, working in a specific country in response to specific challenges. And we have to interpret the kinds of results that we get. The data is never self-evident. What we should do with data is never self-evident. We have to interpret it. And that's especially problematic, I suggest, when we get no result. When, we, when we've made our best attempts to, get, uh, to assess a particular intervention, and we find, alas, that nothing has been achieved. What exactly do we do with that kind of result? Well, I'm, in all three of these cases, I'm going to suggest, uh, are examples of complex interventions, of trying to enhance the quality of an access of education, of being able to uh, navigate with big complex uh, processes of trade negotiation, of being able to uh, empower marginalized groups. All of these are examples of complex interventions, but they are also ones around which making claims about them, either individually or more broadly, uh, when we try and consider the wisdom or folly of scaling and replicating them elsewhere, is very, is very challenging. And I want to try and move our discussions forward on that. Now, as it happens, I think oftentimes uh, the research community, and I am privileged to work with some of the finest uh, researchers in the world, at the, at the World Bank and at Harvard, um, but oftentimes I think we're sometimes part of the problem and not part of the solution. Why do I say that? I, I say that because I think if you look at the way in which so much of our research discourse is conducted, it tends to follow a storyline something like the following. Um, that development policy and practice is plagued by inadequate and low quality hard evidence, hard data. Uh, derived from soft methodologies. Thus, we have too much reliance on anecdotes and advocacy. We have a lack of rigorous evidence about what works. And as a result, finite public resources are deployed inefficiently. Aid effectiveness debates fester and they go unresolved. Taxpayers and, and politicians remain skin, cynical and skeptical about the whole enterprise of development. So to solve this particular problem, what we need is a more scientific gold standard approach we need to do for development what randomized control trials did for medicine, and that, in fact, what we need to do is, is sort of don our white lab coats and uh, pretend that we're real scientists and, and try and make development itself and policy making in particular a more scientific kind of enterprise. That's the story as it's often told. If you listen to the TED Talks by some of the most uh, influential people doing this kind of work today, that's more or less the story that you will hear. And I want to quietly challenge some of those assumptions. Because I think when we move into the space of doing complex work, uh, 
when we do the kinds of challenges and respond to the kinds of challenges that we face. Uh, that kind of way of thinking about these challenges themselves can imprison us. They can uh, end up leaving us, for reasons I will discuss shortly, actually much less able to answer the kinds of questions that we really need to be able to answer in a fuller uh, science, social scientific way. So I think one of the, this becomes apparent, I think, when you start reading more broadly in the social science literature and in the social science, the philosophy of social science, uh, in a book that I would recommend to you if I thought you would really read it, <laughs> but I am not so uh, presumptuous to imagine you would, but there's a, there's a wonderful book by uh, Nancy Cartwright and Jeremy Hardy called Evidence-Based Policy, A Practical Guide to Doing It Better, which is kind of a, a book for evaluators as written by philosophers, which may or may not be of interest to you. <laughs> but the particular, uh, of the many different uh, passages of this book that I think are very important, uh, the big question that, that Nancy and her and spent her career wrestling with in some sense is this question of the generalizability of our knowledge claims. And I'll quote this particular passage at length because it's, it's maybe a little complicated, but it's actually very true. <laughs> the bulk of the literature present, presently recommended for policy decisions cannot be used to identify what works here. And this is not because it may fail to deliver in some particular cases. It is not because its advice fails to deliver what it can be expected to deliver. The failing, rather, is that it is not designed to deliver the bulk of the key facts required to conclude that it will, in fact, work here. So this big question that, that Nancy puts on the table is, what are these key facts that we need to go from statements either about here to there, there to here, or small to large? All of these questions require a certain kinds of much more important information that is often derived from the standard application of a randomized control trial type experiment or type of work. And I think, therefore, that, that this challenge is before us to try and discern what are, are in fact, the key facts that we might need to be able to answer those opening vignette types of questions that I posed. So, the last few years I've been wrestling with uh, the answers to some of those questions, at least what I think might be some of the, the key facts. And I come to this having spent many, many years wrestling with this uh, huge big project in Indonesia, uh, a, a national flagship program uh, introduced just after the uh, end of the Asia financial crisis as Indonesia was transitioning from an autocratic government to a democratic government, a huge big national exercise in trying to reimagine the relationships between citizens and states and being able to provide resources to citizens dealing with uh, the equivalent of a Great Depression that went through their country in the late 90s and the early 2000s. Uh, and more recently, wrestling with uh, questions of justice reform. SDG number 16, as you will remember from earlier discussions at this conference, is about uh, trying to in, ensure justice for all. And how would we ever go about trying to do something like that when for thousands of years humans have been wrestling with this question of how we provide justice for all? So these are big picture questions that have very small picture implications because they are very difficult to answer in ways that uh, are that are defensible, but they're also especially difficult to answer if you only if you set your knowledge claiming world up in such a way that only one particular kind of methodology is deemed to be the right way to answer that particular question. There is nothing, I don't think, in social science theory or methodology that it would actually support that kind of claim. So what I'm going to do for, the, for, the, the, for this talk is then is to sort of uh, give 1.4 cheers. I'm, I'm going to uh, give some muted support for this, uh, this, this storyline around how we should be doing uh, evaluation and research uh, in the broader sense. Um, but then I want to try and show where this all unravels when we start engaging with these questions that are, are of deep complexity. And then pose towards the end, uh, some of the, uh, explore some of the challenges that this poses both for uh, internal validity questions, these challenges of trying to make defensible claims about the impacts of these interventions, but the, problem that follows close behind that, which is the question of how generalizable these kinds of claims can be and the, and the 
uh, related question of whether we can scale up uh, smaller interventions uh, on two larger ones on the basis of this initial result. And then, as you heard me say at the beginning, I think the, the future is only more complex. The world is not going to be a world simply of paving roads or of uh, doing macroeconomic type reforms where we're worrying about whether we should raise or lower interest rates by a quarter of a percentage point. The future is only going to be about the questions that have always plagued humanity, which is the who is us, who is them question, uh, how, we, how we get along. <laughs> how we constrain elite power, how we bring everybody in, how we try to avoid leaving anyone behind. There aren't answers to those questions. They're only questions we navigate, negotiate, and consolidate. And uh, to, do, to wrestle with those kinds of questions, I think social science broadly defined has a lot to tell us. And if we just tie one hand behind our back, as it were, and don't allow ourselves fuller access to a richer array of ideas and evidence, and we're going to be perpetuating a lot of our ineffectiveness, it seems to me, in the space that the world is crying out for effective responses. Okay, so lest my researcher friends think I've completely lost the plot, let me uh, <laughs> uh, open with some reassuring remarks that, of course, more and better data is always desirable. Sound methods are always better than sloppy ones. Uh, we need to be, of course, accountable for our use of public resources, and we have the privilege, many of us, of being stewards of public resources entrusted to us, and we should be ex fully expecting that we be held accountable for those. Uh, raising professional standards in any particular field and meeting high expectations is always a virtue, and the evidence-based policy narrative, as I defined it at the beginning, is incredibly useful for a range of important problems in the world. It can give rise to these things we call best practices, and under certain conditions, those kind, the, the findings and claims that emerge from that can indeed be very useful around the world. So people studying traffic flows, for example, uh, traffic kind of operates more or less the same way everywhere around the world. If someone figures out a, a better way of being able to I'm sure that traffic flows uh, more efficiently and smoothly through congested capital cities of the world, uh, more power to them. <laughs> um, I think there is, there is a whole range of problems in the world for which the orthodox way of thinking about these things is exactly the right way to think about these things. So I'm not uh, on making a, a criticism of, a, of an approach in general. I'm thinking what my, my, my concern is that we're using one particular approach to solve a whole array of different problems for which, it, as Nancy Cartwright said at the beginning, uh, it was not set up to do. <laughs> it was not designed to elicit to this kind of information that we now need. And I want to explore some of that then in more detail. The bigger challenge with the kind of claim that I've just articulated about the importance of having a, uh, a rigorous, tightly controlled, uh, experimental approach to the way in which we think about doing evaluation and research is that it's just simply not how today's rich countries became rich. It's not how today's fastest growing poor countries have become, uh, have, have graduated out of the status of a low income country. Uh, as is well known, it's often hugely expensive and time consuming to do this kind of work when most of the people who are engaged in the very difficult frontline work of implementing policy and practice need this information yesterday. Well, they certainly need it much faster than most of our formal evaluations uh, can actually yield it. Uh, there are often very important ethical concerns with trying to, uh, with trying to randomize uh, well-known uh, interventions, especially in health. Um, and there's often quite legitimate political resistance to engaging in that kind of work. Um, but as I've mentioned before, this kind of approach is, is very good for usually asking questions about average treatment effects, or being able to look at how things work for most people most of the time. Um, but those kinds of approaches don't answer the kinds of questions that we are often asked when we enter this complex development space. Namely, how, why, and for whom an intervention works. It doesn't really help us, I don't think, decide between competing alternatives, especially when the particular constraints under which these decisions are being made are often unobservable. It doesn't help us to uh, discern what I'm distinguished, what I would call the causes of effects as opposed to the effects of causes. Most of the time in experimental design, 
starts with a particular intervention and then tries to look at the effectiveness of that intervention. Uh, sometimes we need to go in reverse. We need to start with an outcome that we observe in the world and we need to try and explain what caused it. Um, and I will give some examples of that shortly. But being able to move backwards and forwards, as it were, or up and down the relationships between our, our variables, between our independent and dependent variables, between the causes and the effects, um, is partly what a fuller rendering of social science helps us to do. And to engage with complex interventions, we need to be able to move in both directions. We need to use both our left and our right hand, as it were. A key component of the work that is entailed with doing complex interventions is that we need a highly capable administrative apparatus to be able to do it. It's really hard to do complicated things by definition, uh, but as my most recent book tries to argue, uh, we are in a world where a, a lot of the really difficult work needing to be done can't be done, not because there isn't a clear policy uh, in support of it, but because the administrative apparatus charged with doing that work simply cannot or will not do it. And uh, so even if a policy on paper looks fine, uh, there's often a very deep challenge with regards to building up the administrative capability of the system to do that. Uh, Anti-corruption law is probably one of the, my favorite examples in that space. There's a whole bunch of countries around the world that have impeccable anti-corruption laws on their books, um, but they are unable to implement those. And so it's not so much a failure of policy. The policy is fairly clear. The challenge is what we do with how, how we build up the capability of a system to do these incrementally more complicated and complex tasks. And finally, the, the challenge with our work from, uh, that's being done from a more narrowly experimental approach is that it's very difficult for that work to turn into something that we can generalize and scale. If the questions are very context specific, if the issues are crucially uh, dependent on the capability of administrative systems to be able to do the work, uh, then it seemed to me fairly straightforward to recognize that the probability that something will work in a novel setting or will work when you make it 10 times bigger than it used to be will be very dependent on the capability of the administrative system to do that kind of work. And so I think we need to explore these things in more detail, and that's what I want to do right now. So I've, I've used this expression, and we in, in popular discourse use this expression of complexity quite a lot. So I just want to give four characteristics that I think define or characterize uh, what a complex intervention looks like. Um, the first of these that it involves lots of discretion, lots of choice. Um, and as we'll see shortly, there are whole fields of human inquiry where there isn't a lot of choice being made by people. <laughs> There isn't any <coughs> resistance on the part of people to uh, doing what they're doing. Uh, where you have discretion, where you have people making very difficult choices, you have a space for deep complexity. Uh, social work is an example of a, of a highly discretionary space. When a social worker goes into a family and has to make a decision about whether this particular family is so dysfunctional that they have to take the children away from their parents and make them wards of the state. Right? incredibly wrenchingly difficult decision to make. <clears throat> Perhaps a different social worker, equally skilled, equally experienced, equally gifted, might make a slightly different decision. Right? That's a discretionary decision. <coughs> Another characteristic of complex interventions is that they have lots and lots of people being involved in them. Everyone in this room, I imagine, is probably the beneficiary of about 15,000 hours of education. That's the number of hours that you've spent in a classroom from the day you went to, first went to kindergarten through the day you got a degree from university. It took 15,000 hours to produce you and me. <laughs> that's, a lot of, that's a lot of hours, right? And teachers also have lots of discretion. Do they spend more time with this child or that child? How strongly or do they hold to the curriculum that they've been given? Um, Education is a, is a notoriously complex intervention for those two reasons alone, that it is deeply transaction intensive and involves quite a lot of discretion. And so it's no surprise that uh, you see enormous variation in education quality around the world. If this was a different talk, I would now diverge off and have a longer riff on all of that. But for present purposes, that's a one of the defining characteristics of a complex intervention. But education actually isn't the most complex because <clears throat> most people in the world, 
pretty much every parent in the world wants their child to get a good education. Most people in the world probably don't want to be taxed, or at least would prefer not to be. Um, <clears throat> if you're working in a, in, a, in a very volatile political environment, as we often are, there is often a whole political party or ideology arrayed against you doing what you want to do. If you're trying to challenge big, powerful corporations, uh, if, if you're a regulator and your job is to stop a Fortune 500 company from exploiting its workers, right? that, that powerful company can bring out the best legal talent and buy off the political support they need to make your work extraordinarily difficult. Right? So there's a difference, I think, between interventions that people essentially want, where you're providing a valued and appreciated and desired service, like health and education, as opposed to imposing an obligation, as opposed to taxing people, as opposed to uh, stopping them often from doing what they might otherwise want to do, which is the task of our justice system. The fourth characteristic of a complex intervention is that it has often no known solution to what uh, we, we are trying to do. We often face these kinds of challenges in the work that we're doing, uh, especially in my own field of, of justice reform, where it's not at all obvious, actually, what needs to be done to respond to the particular challenge. And it's not because we're not smart enough. <laughs> it's not because we haven't thought about it long enough. The nature of the problem is such that it just doesn't yield <coughs> up front the kinds of solutions that we might need. We only figure out what we need to do by actually doing the work itself. Right? Once you're in a world where you have to confess a lot of ignorance about what you're doing, again, not because you're uh, not sufficiently well-educated or trained, but because the kind of problem you are addressing requires that of you, you are in a very, very complex space. So once you're in a world where the challenges you deal with are highly discretionary, highly transaction intensive, involve imposing obligations, and where you don't actually know what the solutions are to the problems are that you're addressing, then you are in this very deeply complex space. And I suggest many of the, either the big challenges or the components of other challenges that we face are increasingly going to look like that. Uh, and education is actually a good example of that. Uh, and if you look at the Sustainable Development Goals on Education as opposed to the Millennium Development Goals on Education, you will see precisely that extension or the ramping up of expectation and the ramping up of complexity. The Millennium Development Goals uh, largely had enrollment as the goal. If kids went to school, we claimed success. Right? Um, but many of us know that uh, the, the schools that many of the children go to uh, they were there, they were physically present, and they could be checked off on some indicator list of uh, meeting a target, but they weren't actually learning much when they went to that particular school. And in recognition of that, the Sustainable Development Goals now ask us to provide learning for all. They insist that we provide peaceful, equitable, and inclusive societies at all levels. <laughs> right? Those are the definition of complex interventions. Uh, and yet, so often I think our thinking and doing with regards to how we would know whether we are achieving that or how we, or the conditions under which we would take a finding or a result from one context to another in the name of trying to be efficient and faithful stewards of public resources leaves us wanting. The important point, I think, is to, in some sense is to go back to very uh, first principles about this kind of stuff and, and, and to recognize that uh, establishing causality in general, establishing a causal claim about the effectiveness of something on something else uh, is notoriously hard, even in the world of white lab coats, which I will get to shortly, uh, <clears throat> let alone in development interventions, let alone in complicated or complex development interventions, and that we need to be able to, uh, one potential way forward is just to look at, uh, get out, ourselves out of our immediate space of social science and to look at how these particular phenomena play themselves out in other fields. So um, consider physics, for example. One of the, if you remember nothing else from my presentation this morning, you can wow people at the next dinner party you go to by asking them, so do you know what the world record is for the number of co-authors on a publication? <laughs> uh, most people think the answer is about 40 or 50. The correct answer is actually 5,154, right? <clears throat> this was uh, three years ago when they were publishing the results of the discovery of the Higgs boson particle. Uh, 
and they were able to uh, publish this paper in Nature or the prestigious uh, scientific journals showing that, yes, indeed, they have, <coughs> have been able to weigh and measure the Higgs boson particle to within 0.25% accuracy. And to do that, it took <coughs> 5,154 physicists' brains to come up with the answer. Just this week, if you've been following the news, you're is at the opposite end of the physics spectrum, astrophysics. Uh, you've just seen this amazing discovery about the collision of these uh, dead stars out in uh, space, a collision that occurred 130 million years ago, and that the physicists have the tools to be able to detect gravitational waves and electromagnetic waves to within two seconds of each other for something that occurred 130 million years ago. Right? <coughs> and they, <coughs> excuse me, and they set the record for the second most highest authored paper by having 3,200 people coordinate within a couple of weeks to be able to produce the papers that came out in the journals to verify that. Right? That's what we're, <laughs> in a world where there's zero transaction intensiveness, where there's no discretion, uh, where there's no people involved, and where there's no stars actively trying to campaign against being measured, right? you can do that kind of stuff. You can discover the most amazing things. You can put rockets into space. You can do all these incredible things when you're not in a complex space. But when you're in a complex space like us, we still struggle so much to even do the most basic, or most, not most basic, the most primal task that humans do, which is to raise children. <laughs> uh, those of us in the room who are parents, and I'm a father of two wonderful teenagers, I, I kind of get this very intensely. Right? Uh, there have been roughly 38 billion experiments in raising children since humanity, since Homo sapiens evolved. Right? What do we know rigorously after 38 billion experiments and how to do the most primal task we do, what do we know for sure about how to raise children? We know, I think, on the basis of a recent systematic review that we should feed them properly when they're young and we should not overly beat them. That's what we've learned, that's what humanity has figured out after 38 billion experiments of the most basic or primal task we do, which is to raise the next generation. That's what we know. <laughs> and yet, these guys can write papers detecting gravitational waves from an event out in, the, in, in, in the outer space that occurred 130 million years ago and can detect it and turn it into sound waves and can now show that, or the, identify the conditions under which gold and uranium is produced. <laughs> that should just blow you away. At least it does with me. <laughs> How can we live in a world where our knowledge claiming is so unbelievably precise in one particular domain that it's just fantastical, that everyone in this room, I assume, unless you're a physicist, just can't even get their head around what either a Higgs boson particle looks like or what gravitational waves from space 130 million years ago looks like, and yet we still can't figure out how to raise kids. <laughs> um, and that says something very profound, I think, <clears throat> about the array, the full spectrum of problems that humans confront. And when problems look like problems that physicists can solve, you can combine 5,154 brains to produce an amazing set of findings, and yet I suggest that much of the interventions we're dealing with in development, and especially in this complex space, are much more in the spectrum of raising kids. <laughs> They're in the spectrum of we have to concede enormous ignorance and enormous uncertainty about what it is we're actually doing, even if it's the most important thing in the world, even if it comes from uh, our souls and from our bodies, uh, how important all of this kind of work is. Um, if you look at the most important event probably that happened in the last 100 years, World War I, right? we're now at the 100th anniversary of this uh, terrible event. If you go to a bookstore now and look at around at the, at the World War I section, <laughs> you'll see hundreds of books on, on World War I. Right? Um, so in the same way that we kind of haven't figured out how to raise kids, we have, historians haven't yet figured out exactly kind of what caused the most cataclysmic event of the, of the world in the last hundred years. Most of these books are written by one, maybe two people. You don't see books on World War I co-authored by 5,000 people. Right? You see books around World War I written by someone who's rest, one individual or two people that have wrestled with this in archives and tried to make sense of a deeply complex problem by doing what I described before, trying to look at the cause of an effect. They start with an outcome. Nobody disputes that World War I happened, but what caused it? Why did we end up with a world trying to slaughter each other? 
Um, and this, and for that, you need a very different set of methodological tools for being able to go back up the rabbit hole to figure out what it was that caused that. And we're not, I, I want to emphasize that we're not in a world here where physicists are super smart and historians are kind of slow and a bit dull. Right? The nature of the problems we're dealing with are fundamentally different problems, and they require very different temperaments, they require very different methods, they require very different theory <clears throat> in order to be able to engage with them on their own terms. It's not as if we would have a, a fully understood theory of, or <laughs> understood story about World War I if only we applied more rigorous methodologies. Right? That is not true. <laughs> World War I is a multi-causal conjunctural event. It happened for all sorts of reasons, and in another 50 or 100 years, the next generation of historians will still be wrestling with that. And I think, again, much of our development interventions kind of look a bit more like, maybe not like World War I, <laughs> but they look like events that uh, have multiple causal factors going on, and we need to be able to engage with them on their own terms. Even in the space, even in the field which invented randomized control trials, like medicine, for example, um, here's a nice simple chart looking at the results of the effectiveness of different food groups on the, on the likelihood that you will get cancer. Right? This is all done by actual people who wear white lab coats for a living, who stare down microscopes and uh, run uh, experiments on uh, very tightly controlled samples of people. Those red dots just show you the ar array of different results that emerge from different studies. So, does coffee cause cancer? Well, it depends on which study you consult. <laughs> All of these are published papers in, a, in, in prestigious journals, and yet half the studies show that, yes, indeed, coffee does cause you cancer. Another half doesn't. Right? Now, you can read that and then be all cynical and say, oh, therefore, science hasn't got anything to say to us. No, on the contrary. It just means that the, we have to be have to have a much richer set of intellectual tools in our head for making sense of the kind of findings that emerge from physics, that emerge from public health research, that emerge from social work, that are, and, and these are very different problems that have very different kinds of ways of uh, engaging with evidence and theory and method to in order to be able to make defensible claims about them. Um, even in the space of, or especially then in the space of generalizing, right? much of the work that's done in public health or in uh, testing of drugs, the effectiveness of, initial, of, of drugs uh, is done testing them on a particular uh, animal, first of all, and then in order to be able to move from testing the effectiveness on humans, it first has to be shown to work on a, on a species of, of creature that is deemed to be roughly similar to, enough to humans to warrant this extrapolation. So this particular uh, mouse that's been bred for this purpose has the delightful name of black six. Um, scientists know more about black six than they do about anything to do with humans. They've genetically engineered this particular creature over many decades so that literally every single thing down to its DNA is known about it. Uh, and it's this particular creature that is used to test out pain medicines and uh, responses to headaches and all sorts of things before they're unleashed on human populations. And in a wonderful, or at least uh, amusing, but sort of instructive expose a few years ago, uh, they realized, unfortunately, that uh, Black Six turned out to be a teenaged alcoholic couch potato with a weakened immune system, and he might be a little hard of hearing. <laughs> so Black Six wasn't even representative of mice. He wasn't even representative of rodents. He wasn't even representative of mammalian species, such that we could then extrapolate on the basis of that into into the world of, of, of the effectiveness of these drugs on humans, leading one review in the New York Times to conclude that years and billions of dollars had been compromised because people didn't understand the external validity challenge that they were actually up against. Right? These are the people we're supposed to be emulating. <laughs> these are the people who are very serious in what they do, who are committed, uh, as equally committed as everyone in this room to trying to figure out how to do serious research, and yet they're plagued by these very fundamental existential challenges around external validity. Right? So if it's true for people that are trying to work with creatures like black sex that they know absolutely everything about, uh, down to the DNA level, and we can't yet figure out how to generalize from that. Right? Once you start moving into this complex development space, we're in a very, very difficult space that we need to be very, very cautious about when we start to imagine that we um, by virtue of method alone, uh, in a uh, 
have warrant to be able to dispense advice to people living in very different contexts and situations. So I think this is what we gain from having a slightly broader perspective on how the real world of complex problems, whether it be detecting gravitational waves or raising children or figuring out what causes cancer, right? we need to be very uh, circumspect about the conditions under which we engage with those questions pertaining to ourselves, to humans, and the kinds of things we do in the name of social policy. And I think just to, on a lighter note perhaps, <laughs> when you think about this in sports as well, we have a, when you have the problems that the sporting world presents to us can be assessed in various different ways as well. So bobsledding on the upper left there, when, those, when they're competing for gold medals at the Olympic Games, the gold medalist sometimes wins by one one thousandth of a second. Right? The way to distinguish who is the best from who is not so good is able to be calibrated incredibly precisely down to the level of one one thousandth of a second. When you're judging uh, ice dancing or surfing or rodeo on the right, that's entirely subjective in, in some sense. A critic would deem it to be entirely subjective, but it's not entirely subjective. It's people who know each of those particular sports in great detail and who can discern in ways that nobody in this room, I imagine, could discern what the difference is between a good bull rider and an excellent bull rider. Right? You have to know what you're looking for. You have to be able to see what other people don't see when you are assessing those particular sports. And we don't criticize these sports for being less rigorous in the way that they're assessed because that is the nature of these sports. That's how you assess these particular problems. It wouldn't be a better sport if we could somehow figure out to the nearest one one thousandth of a second whether one surfer was better than another. <laughs> right? we, we judge these problems on their own merits by what kind of a problem they are and what kind of expertise is thus required to make judgments about them. And I think you know, that I'm making this point to suggest that we, in, in the complex development space, we need to give a lot more attention and space to those people who can see what we cannot see, people who live with these realities on a day-to-day -day basis who can discern whether things are better than something else, not on the basis of a, of, a, of a method per se, but on the basis of hard-won experience about what constitutes success and what it looks like for these people in this particular place. That's how the real world functions, and I think we should be okay about saying that that's how we can do evaluation work as well. Okay. So. Let's formalize things a little bit. <laughs> uh, when we're trying to make or to extrapolate uh, impact claims in evaluation, we need to worry about four different things. I'm not going to go into detail on, on uh, the first one, this construct validity, this question of whether words make sense to different people and the, the rendering of our concepts in language of one kind or another. I'm not going to deal with that. I am going to deal with these, the second and third and fourth question. This, these questions of causality, which I've already addressed in some sense, of the internal validity questions. Um, but I'm also going to argue that in the complex space, we need to assess the evidence that we get against a theory of change, against a set of reasoned expectations about what uh, we need to have. And I'm going to make it an unapologetic plea for theory as your friend, not as uh, some uh, academic thing that you should be intimidated by or you think is useless. Actually, theory is crucial for reasons I will explain shortly. It's also crucial when we start to make these uh, external validity claims or these questions about generalizing and scaling. Just a quick point on why we need theory. Right? The most elementary thing that has seemed evident to human beings every day for the last 100,000 years since humans had cognition to be able to discern it is that the sun rises in the east every day. Right? Every single day of our lives we wake up and we, say, we watch the sun come up in the east and we say, yes, the sun is rising in the east. But of course, everyone in this room knows that the sun does not, in fact, rise in the east. The earth rotates anti-clockwise such that it appears that the sun is rising in the east. The sun's not going anywhere. It stays where it is. The earth moves such that it appears that the sun is rising in the east. So if you took the evidence at face value, you would conclude, as every human has concluded for most of the last 100,000 years, that indeed the sun rises in the east. But we have a theory about the world, about the cosmos, <laughs> that smart people have taught us that say, no, in fact, when we see the sun rise every single day, we need to be aware of the fact that this is an illusion, actually. What we are seeing is evidence of the Earth rotating such that it appears that the sun is rising. 
right? So the evidence isn't self-evident. The evidence only makes sense because we have a theory about how things rotate in the, in the universe that makes, it, makes us able to interpret that evidence in a way that makes coherent sense within a, a whole bunch of other phenomena that we observe in the rest of the cosmos. Right? Now, that's a simple example, but I think a very powerful one for stuff that we'll get to shortly when we look at what evidence might suggest with regards to complex interventions that with a different kind of theoretical frame might lead us to conclude something rather different. One of the characteristics of complex interventions is that they generate huge variations. They generate uh, wild standard deviations, as we might say slightly more formally. Uh, you can have a policy, as, as this particular graph shows in Yemen, of staff showing up for work every day, right? and yet have a, a realization of that policy that ranges literally from 8 to 88%. <laughs> Uh, with regards to whether that policy is actually being observed or being realized. And one of the reasons that happens is that because you're trying to do something very difficult, uh, even when the policy is clear, you, uh, because it requires humans to do things, like show up for work when they might not otherwise want to show up for work, or when they live in a world where there's no consequences for whether they do or they don't show up for work, uh, you are just likely to see this huge standard deviation, this huge variation in outcome. And I think that's going to be, that'll be really important because so much of our claiming in evaluation work is about averages, right? The average in Yemen is about uh, 38 or 39%. <laughs> but that doesn't really tell you all that much. I mean, that's a shocking number as well, that, uh, that absenteeism will be at around uh, over a third of, or two-thirds of the population of workers won't even show up for work every day. Um, but the reality is that that's, it's, it's actually hugely variable. There are places where essentially everybody shows up for work, and there are places where nobody shows up for work, right? And they're all ex operating under the same policy. They've all been trained at the same school. They all get paid the same amount of money. Uh, yet, there is this enormous variation. And I think that's something we can uh, fruitfully engage with in a whole range of the issues that we, are in, uh, that we wrestle with. Complex interventions, like raising children, uh, like even curing cancer, <laughs> generate these big outcomes, these big standard deviations, even when the method itself is pretty tight. And we need to recognize that in the space of, of our complex interventions that an average is an average. An average tells us something, but it actually, from a practitioner's point of view, doesn't tell us the full story. It doesn't tell us actually what we need to know to be able to improve that situation, uh, which is to learn from those places that have already figured out how to make this uh, a better uh, a better situation. A characteristic, another characteristic of these types of interventions is that they don't actually have counterfactuals. They don't have uh, worlds in which things would look uh, different but for this particular intervention. And so when you're in a space where you can't cleanly identify, where you can't uh, distinguish between a world in which an, event happen, an intervention happens and when it doesn't, uh, when you're endogenous, as it were, to the system in which you operate, that's when understanding much more about these standard deviations can be a much more fruitful way of learning and of making claims about the effectiveness and generalizability of these particular interventions. Um, I could, we can formalize this even further and just say this, this, some of these things I think are examples of what we would call non-reciprocal variables. They're, they're variables that work in one particular direction when they're all positive and heading in the same way, but <clears throat> when you uh, turn them, when the you turn them around and push them back in the other way, they actually become much more variable. Uh, Tolstoy, I think, indicated this in the famous opening line to Anna Karenina, when he said that happy families were all the same and unhappy families were unhappy in their own way. A very profound statement for evaluators. <laughs> uh, <coughs> if you're in a world where all the good interventions kind of end up looking the same, uh, but you're in a world where the bad projects aren't just the opposite of the good projects, they're all different in their own way, Right? If you're in a space like that, then you have to have a much richer set of empirical tools at your disposal to be able to explain why it is that, in fact, these places that are uh, where nobody is showing up for work are, in fact, looking like the way they do. There probably isn't a singular explanation for why some places uh, have 83% absenteeism, but I bet you that all the, happy, all the happy places where everybody shows up for work kind of start to look more or less the same. <laughs> But if you're in a world where it's just the opposite of that isn't true to, for explaining the least successful outcomes, 
you need a very different array of often qualitative tools of uh, embedding yourself in the process of implementation itself to figure out what's going on. So what do we do? Well, one of the things I think that we need to do is to endogenize research and evaluation into the implementation process. And we're seeing some initial examples of that. I'm most familiar with the ones that are happening at the World Bank, but I'm sure and I hope that some of you are engaged in that work as well. Um, here, you're really trying, because you can't figure out upfront what needs to be done, because you can't set up a log frame that perfectly specifies everything you're going to do or identifies every contingency that you might encounter, uh, you have to be part of the implementation process itself. That's a very different model uh, and often one that would deem in different circles us to be compromised, to have lost our independence in some sense. I think the reality of engaging with complex interventions is that there are trade-offs to be made. And if the, the part of being a professional engaged uh, as part of the implementation process, as an evaluator who is part of an implementation process, is being able to help a system learn in real time how to address the kinds of challenges that it faced. My good friend and colleague uh, Vijendra Rao in India has uh, done a whole bunch of this kind of work um, with his uh, work on livelihoods in, in some of the poorest states of India where uh, they have, they use the full array of social science tools. They do randomized control trials, but they also do work where they uh, embed their researchers in the life of these interventions to be able to explain what's going on. So that open, the third of those opening vignettes that I, that I just gave to you comes from that kind of work where they did a big formal evaluation of this project and found, on average, no impact. But it was, they were only able to interpret why, in fact, they got this non-result because they also had teams of people who've been living through the experience of this project in various different places around in Bihar that enabled them to be able to tell a much more sophisticated and useful and interesting story about why, in fact, this project on average had not worked but had been actually pretty awful for some people but fantastic for others. On average, it was zero, but you got a plus three over here or maybe a minus two over there. Right? Well, why did you get that variation? Well, they were able then to use their qualitative research teams to be able to explain why, on average, we got zero, which wasn't then a basis for canceling the project. It was a basis for learning from those places where it had worked and from those places where it hadn't to be able to steer the ship now in a slightly different direction and hopefully with a more positive outcome the next time they evaluate these things. But relying on a singular method alone to be able to make a decision about whether this project was effectiveness or not is kind of like just looking at the sun every morning and saying, yes, the sun rises in the east. If you don't have a good, a richer set of theory at your disposal, then you end up making, I think, very uh, premature, at least, decisions about the effectiveness of these things. I think another implication, another thing we can do in response to this deep complexity is to not just see that we have an intervention that starts with a, a cause and then we try and set up a, a methodological strategy that helps us to identify as best we can the effectiveness of that cause, it's to realize that so much of our work in policy actually just has to start with an outcome. We observe that a particular place or a particular policy or a project of one kind or another seems to have done pretty well, but we're not sure. Right? Then we're kind of in this equivalent of a World War I situation where we have an outcome that we observe, but we're not sure what actually caused it. And to do that, we need to be able to head upstream. We have to swim against the current, as it were, to be able to figure out what it was at particular times and places in the past that enabled configurations of actors and processes to come together at a particular time to make it possible for these things to actually succeed. That's a very different way of thinking about what you do as an evaluator. It's very different from what most researchers think their business is. But if we're going to engage with complex interventions, that, I suggest, is one of the very important things we need to be able to do. Let me sort of spend the last little bit talking about this, more formally about this the issue of the theory of change. And here I'm just going to use a, an artist. <laughs> um, when nothing seems to help, I go back and look at the stone cutter, hammering away at his rock, perhaps a hundred times, without as much as a crack showing in it. Yet at the hundred and first blow, it will split in two, and I know it was not that blow that did it, but all that had gone before. Right? Ponder that for a bit as, an, as, a, as a social scientist. Right? Uh, what does that tell us? It says that if you observe someone cracking a rock, chipping a, a stonemason, a sculptor, working with this rock, and they chip, 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 chip away at the rock, nothing happens after a hundred chips. Do you conclude that therefore they don't know what they're doing, that they've failed? 
right? No. If you know something about stone chipping, you know that it takes a hundred little chips to create the little micro weaknesses that then on the hundred and first create the bigger break that actually cause the thing to break. So you have lots of nothingness as observed, suddenly a big change occurs. Right? If we were distinguishing between sunflowers and acorns, different types of uh, growth rates in different plants, horticulturalists think about this all the time. They have different theories of change that underpin what is going on. So if we judged your effectiveness as a farmer by giving you seeds, but I happen to give you sunflowers, and I said I will measure your effectiveness by the height of the plant that you grow. Right? And I came back after six weeks and measured your effectiveness, and sure enough, you have a very impressive six-foot flower standing next to you. I think, well done, good and faithful horticulturalist. You have done great work. Right? And I happened to give someone else an acorn, and I put it in the ground, and I said, I'll come back in six months or, and, and see what you've done. And there's nothing, because it takes two years for an acorn to actually even become a little shoot. Uh, and then 200 years later, you have the, the full-grown tree. No one says that the sunflower grower is a more effective horticulturalist than the acorn grower because there's a fundamentally different theory that underpins the life of the intervention that they're working on. Right? Now, if you extend that out and think about how we most of the time think about evaluation, most of the time we start with a baseline, we start with a follow-up, we we'll conclude with a follow-up, and then we do some fancy uh, statistics of one kind or another. Uh, and if we've got a good methodology, even better, we can then just separate out the difference between the, the beginning and the end, and we claim to have discerned an impact. But if you look at the likely reality that complex interventions, as I've just described them, follow deeply non-linear paths and have huge standard deviations associated with them, then the kinds of claims that you would make at any particular time are likely to be hugely variable. Right? The, 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 the stone cutter that I just described to you has an impact trajectory that looks like that green line. Lots of nothingness, and then on the 101st chip, bang, there's a really big uptake. Right? I would suggest to you that a lot of political reform kind of looks like that. You chip away in obscurity for long periods of time, and then maybe something big happens. The blue line, I think, is, is the most contentious one of all, where you seemingly create a, a, a worse problem before it turns around and gets better. And there's lots of evaluations done of, of, of work uh, on women's empowerment projects, for example. And so the first thing that happens when you empower women is that men beat their wives up because they suddenly don't like the fact that their women are challenging them anymore. Right? Taken at face value, does that mean your project is awful or that you're actually succeeding because now you're giving people a voice to be able to articulate and respond to something that they previously might not have even bothered talking about? Um, and I would suggest that for half this audience at least, we're still in a 200 plus year process of trying to figure out how to bring about gender equality. And have we failed because we haven't yet achieved it? Well, in some sense, yes, but maybe it's kind of just a kind, the kind of problem we face is so complicated that it's gonna take maybe another six months, maybe another six years or 600 years to fully realize this. We don't know. It's not clear at all how you respond to a challenge like that but you have to be involved in it anyway. And the United Nations community, the world, has, in, has formally committed itself to being on that kind of a journey, but it needs, I think, to have a much richer sense of the, what the theory of change kind of looks like that underpins that. In other work that I've done, I've sort of talked about these shooting star projects, these ones at the top, they have a, that emerge spectacularly, like the sunflower, after six weeks, and everybody celebrates them as being these wonderful interventions, only to discover six months later or six years later that that, pro that project has completely died and that it has uh, no longer has any effects at all. Now, all, if all you did was to evaluate these projects at time C, right, you would get exactly the same conclusion and you would uh, convene at a conference like this and tell a pretty similar story. But if your trajectory of impact looks something like line, that point B and you've, uh, in, in effect, arbitrarily decided to evaluate it, say, two years after you uh, have achieved um, uh, implementation, you would tell four different stories about the kind of effectiveness that this one had. And if you were evaluating it at point A, you would still have four different stories, but they'd be four even more different stories. You'd have one very successful story, one moderately successful, one failure story, and one diabolically failured story that this, in fact, made things worse. You don't want to be the evaluator or the implementer who gets evaluated at point A when you're at uh, on the blue line. 
Right? Now, that's a formalized way of suggesting and recognizing, I think, that when we're in the implementation space of complex interventions and when we're evaluating implementation, the effectiveness of these interventions, we can't just take the evidence at face value the way we take the sun rising in the morning at face value. We need to recognize that there's a theory that has to underpin this. We have to assess and make a claim about the effectiveness of this on the basis of a richer understanding of what's actually going on underneath. And we have to have theory for that, There's, uh, or experience. Some combination of those two things is really only how I think we can dif discern those kinds of uh, correct responses. Okay, let's try and... So the final thing I want to talk about then is, well, how do we generalize on the basis of any of that? So if we're in this space that has high standard deviations, uh, that has uh, in, across space, and has highly nonlinear trajectories over time, how then do we start to generalize to much broader contexts? Well, there I think we need to begin with these questions of uh, understanding the, the nature of the intervention itself. This is why we need to have a theory that, that distinguishes what we do from what physicists and um, doctors and social workers do. What kind of intervention are we talking about when we're engaging in the evaluation of it? We need to have a much richer sense of the implementation capability of, this, of the administrative system that we're asking to do this kind of work. We need to have a much richer sense of the contextual compatibility of this particular initiative. Is this something that people in this particular context themselves have nominated and prioritized as something they would like to see addressed, which may or may not be what external experts, so-called, have deemed to be what they think they should be worrying about. And fourthly, what does that impact trajectory look like? What are the reasoned expectations we might have about when and how this kind of impact should be achieved? Those are the kinds of key facts, I think, at a, at a, at a, in essence, that we need uh, in response to this question, uh, this challenge that Nancy Cartwright posed to us in her book, and I, I'm posing to all of us, and indeed that the vignettes that I opened with posed to us as well. When we answer, it depends, to these big questions of whether we should take a pilot to scale, or whether we should uh, take a non-result and shut it down, or whether we should take a general finding and, and apply it to our own specific context, the key things that we need to answer, at least to ask and then try to answer, are these questions about the nature of the intervention itself, around the capability of the system to do what it is we're asking it to do, whether it enjoys the, the, the local legitimacy and resonance in, in, in responding to uh, problems that local people themselves have nominated and prioritized, and do we have a theory about when it would be reasonable to expect some kind of positive outcome to be achieved, and are we willing to provide the necessary political support for things that might in fact take decades to be able to achieve. We've built that consensus in education. We know full well that it takes at least 12 years to produce a minimally functional citizen in the modern world. Uh, and we have, we've brought, we've constructed a political consensus that recognizes that investments, so-called, in young kids probably won't pay off for, for decades later. We need to have that same kind of political calculus that we invest in so much of our other ones as well. So I conclude by saying what are the implications of this? I think we need to take well, most of our work in the research community and I think in the evaluation world as well has been largely obsessing around these questions of causal impact and, have, and has settled too quickly and too narrowly on one particular modality of, of making or, or being the referee about those kinds of claims. And to be clear, I'm not saying that is always wrong. I'm saying it's one tool among many. When it does what it's supposed to do, it's exactly the right way to think about it. When it starts to mess with the kinds of complex interventions that I've just described, it doesn't help us, I, don't, I would suggest, or at least is only providing very partial responses to that. But when it's imbued with the status that Harvard and MIT type people can imbue it with, then I think it, it can crowd out a lot of the space for more creative thinking and doing that we need to respond to those things. I think we need to expand the array of tools that we have to bring to bear on these things, which, which is another way of saying I think we need to have teams of people be involved with that. The big breakthroughs that are occurring, that we saw in physics, occur because 5,000 people can coordinate. And maybe they can coordinate because their, their problem is the nature of it is. But I think in social science too, we need to have a much richer sense of recognizing that different forms of expertise are required to engage in these and coherently integrated into a, a package that can help us to wrestle with both the causal questions and the generalization questions. I think the third implication is that we need to worry way more about implementation that we, than we do. Uh, so much of our discussion in 
uh, circles like this is around my policy versus your policy. We, it's all about the policy implications of. Uh, we write papers that conclude with a, sec a section that has that explicit title. It's very, very rare to see a paper that concludes with the implications for implementation. How would we actually know whether the government of Chad or Chile or China could actually do whatever it is that we're decide when we've discerned? When we have a nice result, um, I would suggest that when implementation is so fundamental to achieving the outcome, we need to have a correspondingly much richer set of tools for engaging with the implementation challenge that, uh, that inherently goes with doing complicated work. Um, and finally, I think we need to make theory our friend. We need to recognize that when we're dealing with this deep uncertainty, the only way to hold it all together, the only way to have a map that can guide you through that uncertainty is to at least have some sort of theory of change or at least a theory of the kind of trajectory that you think reasonably you are on in this particular time, this particular place, with these particular people in response to this particular kind of challenge. That's the kind of space that we're so often in right now, either at a project at a whole or the component parts of projects that become the binding constraints on realizing the fullness of those other interventions as well. So, those are the kind of things that I think we need to be wrestling with much more seriously. We can't just privilege methodology. We have to have an array of theory, an array of tool, an array of methods, and see this much more as a team-based enterprise, but what's one that isn't just done by well-educated people like us. <laughs> Most of these interventions are messing with people's lives, with their identities, with their livelihoods, and we need to see people themselves as being in fundamentally involved in helping make decisions about effectiveness. Of, these, of, of the kinds of uh, tools that we're wielding here. That again is a very difficult challenge for people that have got nice degrees from nice places to be able to defer to those who actually have much richer understanding, who can see what we cannot see and will never be able to see be almost precisely because we've been trained out of being able to see what we need to see. Um, I suggest those are the kinds of challenges that complexity uh, presents to us and that I hope that as we as a community engage with these questions in the, in the years and decades to come. Indeed, as we try to realize the, the goals of the sustainable development goals, the challenges that they have put for us are mostly complex challenges. We need to be thinking, I think, a little more like this if we are going to make discernible progress against them. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Michael, for an excellent uh, rendition of the whole area of complexity. I'm not going to try and uh, summarize. Uh, you have taken us from space to mice and everything else in between it. But one issue that has emerged and which is uh, pertinent to this event is the question of discretion. As evaluators, as practitioners, we have the ability to choose. And what we choose effects has implications in terms of the results and the impact. Uh, so given the, the, the time issue, I will take a few uh, comments and reactions, uh, ask Michael to respond, and then we move into, into the coffee break. If I could just have a show of hands, please, and I'm going to slice it through in, 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 in three areas. We've got one here, gentleman in the back, and there. Good. So you could have the mics. Thank you, Michael, for a fascinating talk. Uh, uh, I, I think you covered, like Indran said, a wide range of issues. And for me, the question is not 5,000 physicists uh, arriving at something, uh, and we need too many people. But uh, what was missing in your talk was you didn't touch upon the subjectivity of the researchers as well as the evaluators. Uh, even the RCT uh, examples you gave in countries, I think the researchers go with their own pet ideas and pursue for evidence to, uh, to further explain those ideas. And I think sometimes evaluators also get into the same trap. How does one avoid subjectivity with physicists or some of the scientists in medicine don't have uh, when they start uh, experiments? Thank you. Thank you. Could I ask the gentleman in the back? Uh, merci beaucoup pour uh, votre uh, conférence. Uh, par rapport à la, au thème de la complexité, uh, 
quand on rapproche cette problématique de celle des objectifs de développement durable, euh, cela m'inspire euh, une... Quand on rapproche euh, la problématique de la complexité de celle des objectifs du développement durable, cela m'inspire euh, une réponse qu'avait donnée euh, Albert Einstein à euh, un parterre euh, où il avait donné une conférence et qui lui avait posé la question « Comment enseigner la physique quantique ?» La réponse d'Albert Einstein a été, à mon sens, très pertinente, et elle s'applique à notre sujet, celui des ODD. Il leur a dit « Il faut simplifier au maximum, mais pas plus. » Donc, en ce qui nous concerne, la prise en charge des ODD, bien sûr que c'est très complexe, mais il faudra arriver à simplifier, et surtout, euh, une des, un des enseignements que je tire de votre conférence, c'est que euh, où est le problème s'il y a complexité S'il y a complexité, c'est parce que il y a des risques. Et donc, euh, moi, euh, ça m'inspire l'idée que chaque pays, en tout cas pour euh, l'Algérie, c'est une proposition que je vais faire, quand on prend en charge la, la mise en œuvre des ODD, on va euh, probablement aller vers une espèce de cadre logique où il ne faut surtout pas oublier les deux dernières colonnes, hypothèse et risque. Parce que c'est là où on doit surveiller les effets de la complexité, les dérapages et euh, probablement les, les erreurs et les fausses routes qu'on peut faire. Merci. Uh, thanks for the presentation, really inspiring uh, on a last day of a conference like this. Look, I really enjoyed the, the part on experimentation, uh, learning, and iterative dimension, uh, and also the adaptation, because I do think that that is at the center of, uh, of this agenda. Uh, classical models that have been used in the past, that more quantitative, I don't know if they're really people-centered. And uh, there are a lot of bottom-up approach in terms of what is being done. Now, how do we link those to the higher level of aggregation uh, so that that really makes a sense and then policies speak to people? Because I do think that that is what the agenda is demanding. Thank you. Uh, we won't take further questions, and I'm going to ask Michael to uh, give a response within five minutes because we need to go to coffee. Uh, and this translation issue we need to catch up. Thank you. Thank you for those questions. And I'm sure there are others. I'm around for the rest of the day. If you want to collar me at some point over the next few hours, you, uh, the next day, actually, you can uh, do that. Uh, and I'm, I should say I'm eager to learn from your experiences with this stuff as well. I'm, I don't claim to have solved it, but the essence of a complicated problem like evaluating complex projects is that you have to practice what you preach. You have to be iterative in the way in which you go about this work. So if uh, the whole point of a Q&A session is to do that in a conference, but the larger point for me being here is to, just to learn from the hard-won experiences that you've had trying to wrestle with these things. The question of subjectivity, I think, uh, is, a, is a common problem across uh, research in general. I think it's one reason why you need to have teams of people being involved in this to, to do the triangulating kind of work to be able to uh, discern what is in fact the, the noise uh, from the signal, uh, which is to say how do you, you uh, are inherently dealing with subjective uh, questions um, a lot of the time in evaluation. And we usually tend to use that word somewhat disparagingly or as if that's uh, worse than objective. Um, But as I tried to use with my uh, uh, rising sun example, that even seemingly objective evidence uh, can be very misleading if it's not couched in terms of a theory. What we need to do with subjective work, I think, is do this uh, inter-rater reliability problem. We have, to, we have to recognize that oftentimes the people's perceptions of things are, uh, I wouldn't say biased, they're, a func they're an individual's perceptions, they are just that. Uh, but in order to aggregate that, uh, which is our third question, we have to have mechanisms in place that be able to help us 
discern that. And that's a people process. Subjective uh, ideas and subjective perceptions are only able to be amenable to, some, to an instrumentality like policy if there is an, an aggregation mechanism. And that aggregation mechanism is usually by being able to put it through a, com a community of practice that, uh, whether it's a local community itself or uh, through a larger body of people that helps us discern what is in fact uh, an outlier comment, so to speak, or something that reflects a deeper uh, and more widely held truth. So I think the response to subjectivity is largely uh, one that we solve uh, through a community in some way, and that doesn't necessarily mean that's perfect either. It just, uh, because the legitimacy of the process by which an individual's, a series of individual's perceptions get aggregated is so crucial, uh, we have to find legitimate processes for that to happen, and I think uh, the most general of those is, is, a, is a civic forum of one kind or another. That's why we have conferences like this, because everybody has their own perception of, what the, of how good this conference is or what they're learning from, but we aggregate that through some particular mechanism that we all agree upon, and that becomes what we deem to be the right, uh, the good enough response to that. Um, uh, when I began my career, I sort of, I, I think I, perhaps echoing, not, I never put myself in the same space as Einstein, but I, not even remotely, but uh, I wanted to simplify what everybody thought was complicated, and I wanted to complicate what everybody thought was simple. <laughs> and I think when we, why you see me responding the way that I do to a lot of these uh, questions around complexity is that when otherwise very smart people uh, seem to think that there is a, a way to solve the complexity problem. And uh, I don't think that's true. I think there are ways to solve this that are slightly better than other ways. And tying one hand behind your back and when you wrestle with those complicated problems is not a good way forward. Um, so I think it's, uh, we need to do the best we can as professionals, whether it's in Algeria or anybody else, by being able to turn these global aspirational targets uh, as exemplified in the Sustainable Development Goals and figure out what that means to each country. Uh, that's how we imbue them with local legitimacy. They shouldn't be done just because the rest of the world tells us to. We do them because they make sense for us. Um, but we then have to, uh, in, a couple of, in a decade or so's time, when we're having conferences like this, we'll be dealing uh, very uh, seriously with these aggregation challenges of how we take Algeria, Australia, and Austria <laughs> and add them up into a claim about whether justice has been achieved for all and whether we have made it an inclusive societies and institutions at all levels. All of that will require um, a, a combination of imbuing things with local legitimacy, uh, but also a serious enough methodology for being able to aggregate all of that to what becomes a story, what becomes an account of what has been achieved over um, the, the 15 year period from 2015 uh, to 2030. Um, in, in, other, if it, in a slightly different talk, I would be distinguishing between experiments and experimentation. Um, maybe that doesn't translate too well outside of English, but I think there is a difference between an experiment in a white lab coat kind of sense and experimentation where we are making it up as we go along, where we're iterating, where we are learning from the experiences that we are encountering. And I think that's how we learn languages. I think that's how we learn to play musical instruments. It's learn how we learn to play a sport by not being very good at it until we get a little bit better. <laughs> and I think evaluating complex interventions uh, needs to have that sort of spirit about it. Um, I think the kind of uh, way in which we try to wrestle with complex interventions is to recognize that it isn't just a matter of bringing a SWAT team to bear on this particular problem, the experts who will know what to do. Uh, we we have to collectively figure out our own capability to do evaluations of complex projects. It's hard to do this kind of work, as I hope you saw from my slides. It's hard to do this even in fields where we can control the DNA of the objects that we're trying to study, like the, the mice. Right? Um, but we can't do that with people, so we have to. It's a, it makes it makes the the, prop, the object that the, the the intervention we're studying complex, but it means that we who are evaluating it are faced with a very difficult, complex task as well, and that complexity requires high capability, and requiring the capability to do that requires us to be taking our formal tool kits and, and theory box, but 
figuring out how to adapt that into the specific context in which we're working and doing that with our counterparts uh, who have, may have very different backgrounds, very different disciplinary trainings. But that's what we need to do. And it's not obvious how you do that. Uh, there are only sort of general, then it remember the raising children kind of problem, where the general principles are there, but all the devils are in the details about how you actually make that manifest in a particular place. So as much as we want to have our individual training programs, for example, I think a large part of what we need to be doing is having group training around these things, because teams of people will be required to do that. That doesn't sound very radical. Actually doing that work would have a very different way of thinking about how we do what we call capacity building, for example. So those are my general uh, responses to your, to your good questions. I will be around, and we need to have a break now, but if you have other comments that you would like to post to me directly or to online or email me for that matter, that would be fine. Thank you.